how long this will take to do these various things. Some will take a shorter time, some will take a longer time. But you provisionally decide, okay, uh, we arrived here at um, 10.56 and um, we've received the handover, these are the tasks, this is going to take a couple of hours, I think. So two hours later, you'll say to, you'll say to your team, in two hours' time, let's aim to be leaving. And guaranteed, two hours, if you don't do that, two hours will come and go, and you will not recognize that. Three hours will come and go, or four hours will come and go. Um, or it may be that your team is thinking, let's just move this patient now. Let's not mess around at all. And it's equally important to make sure that you don't rush, that you don't scoop and run, that the patient morbidity and mortality is likely to be much higher by a poorly prepared patient, and that actually these tasks that we've identified that need to be done, need to be done. So in two hours time, we will say, where, what have we achieved at this point? Preparing um, sort of communication handover, that's really important. So a group handover, we promote the idea of a group handover, doctors and nurses and relevant personnel together, one person speaking at a time, we avoid parallel conversations going between doctor and doctor, nurse and nurse, where information is maybe missed, you speak together as a group. It does not matter if the person doing the speaking does not know the most recent blood gas or a minor change to the ventilation. After the handover is over, the other people who do know can add in, can say, since this has happened, actually, I've turned the oxygen down, I've turned the pressures up here, that sort of thing. So a group handover where everyone is clear on who is who, um, and where confidentiality can be uh, maintained if possible. Um, again, the patient will need re-evaluation um, and the prioritization task may, uh, a task list may, may be changed. Preparation of the baby is all clinical. Stabilizing the baby um, uh, physiologically and then physically moving them from cot to transport incubator safely without anything coming out or being dislodged and we will talk through that in the workshops, um, and then uh, securing the baby in the transport incubator, and then the actual transportation itself. <clears throat> so that process of when the team arrive follows a certain format. Obviously, introductions, facilitating hand handover, washing hands, connecting all the rechargeable equipment to the main. So the transport incubator and all the equipment on it, the batteries should only be used between hospital and vehicle. At all other times, you're using either the hospital power supply or the vehicle power supply. So it's important that everything's um, plugged in. At the end of the handover, double check the documentation, the discharge documentation is, is correct, it's accurate, um, that you've got um, blood results, copies of drug charts, x-rays, etc. But you've got everything that you would need for perfect continuity of management from referring to receiving hospital. Um, having listened to the, the history and looking at the results, it's important to, of course, examine the child yourself. Um, I've got hours of anecdotal stories of transfer teams that have assumed that the patient condition or the ventilator settings or the position of the endotracheal tube is as it was when the patient was referred. Things clearly change. We've even had handover between our own teams where things have changed or where x-rays have not been reviewed. Perforations that have been missed because the first team did not see it. The patient goes to a medical centre the receiving unit note the perforation. The patient then has to undergo a secondary transfer to a, to a, a surgical centre. So evaluate the baby yourself. Document the observations, identify the priorities, make a plan, and above all, um, communicate it. Um, there's a book that's come out recently called Black Box Thinking. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Black Box as, re regard, as relating to an aeroplane. So if the co-pilot cannot feel confident to tell the captain that there is a mountain ahead, then 
the plane will go down and the casualties will be in the hundreds. So the hierarchy, although it is established, needs to feel free to say, I, don't th I think there's a problem here. And not just assume that the expert is the expert or the most senior person is the most senior person who has all the answers. In the UK, we have a very frequently circulated video um, that was produced by the husband of a lady who went in for routine sinus surgery. And um, the anaesthetist could not cite the endotracheal tube. And a series of anaesthetists at a very senior level went in, took over from each other to try and get established an airway for this lady. You may have seen it, it's, quite, it's been circulated quite, quite a lot. And ultimately she, she, she died from hypoxia. But the scrub nurses in the room had recognised that there was an opportunity, that this was failing a number of times, there was an opportunity for a surgical airway, a tracheostomy, and even brought in the tracheostomy kit, but didn't feel confident to say, we can't intubate, but clearly it's challenging. Is this an option? And it's not that people don't know these things, but when you get into closed loop thinking, this is what human beings do. So we have to feel confident to, to actually um, uh, say to each other, that sounds like a great plan, but can I just bring this to your attention? Okay, so preparation, packaging, pre-departure checks are all about minimizing intervention in transit, making sure the actual physical transport is as uneventful as um, possible. So it's an ABC approach to the patient, resuscitate, stabilize, Assume the patient condition will worsen as a result of the transfer. You could almost assume that will be the case. So the optimization needs to bring the patient up to a level that can tolerate the actual journey. Moving the patient, a sick, unstable patient, in their current state is, 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 as is almost certainly going to result in complications. Um, establishing adequate airway, vascular access, and the required level of monitoring. We're optimizing the patient physiology in all of these things that we've said, but when we modify the treatment, we must always reassess the efficacy of what we've done. So at that time window that you have seen, the patient is always going to be associated with the risk of airway dislodgement, line dislodgement, etc. So making sure that we've got all of these things um, in place, that you're monitoring effectively, that lines are secure. securing all the access, checking the ET tube security yourself, checking umbilical line security yourself, checking chest drain security yourself, attaching it to flutter valves, the ventilator tubing, nasogastric tubing, and the actual physical movement of the baby, although it's not a 70 kilogram patient, it's a small patient, must still have tasks allocated to the person who is lifting the baby, the baby who's dis person who's disconnecting the ET, who's reconnecting it, who's gathering up the lines, just moving from there to there can undo a lot of the good work that you put in. So just make sure that, that don't assume to allocate tasks, it's just safe practice. Don't worry about patronizing anybody, telling people what they already know, it's always safe. When the co-pilot takes over flying the plane from the pilot, they both know that transition is going to happen, but the co-pilot will say, I now have control of the aircraft. You have to speak. So this is just um, uh, an image of the uh, neo-restraints uh, system that we use um, for uh, maintaining the infant security within the actual transport um, uh, incubator itself. It's important, important to have emergency equipment to hand and when we did simulations recently, two weeks ago, with our own team, so a spontaneous spot check, my colleague um, Saeed, he said, right, let's go and do some simulation training. We put the mannequin in the ambulance, um, and he simulated a, um, a tube dislodgement in the vehicle. It took about four minutes before we were able to re-establish um, a secure airway with this patient. 
four minutes of potential hypoxia in a simulation type setting. And three of those four minutes were spent by fumbling around in different bags that had not been packed properly, that hadn't had the, the, um, uh, the checklists done and signed off. Uh, when people had moved around things from one compartment to the other, where there was lots of rubbish in some of the um, uh, some of the compartments, so this sort of thing needs to be part of the daily culture of of checking the equipment bags and making sure things are, are signed off. Even with experienced teams, these sorts of delays drift in. So this is just having a reminder of having all the important uh, resuscitation type equipment to hand. <coughs> Make sure that when you're uh, packaging up the baby, you've got all the documentation, the discharge summary, um, all the written assessments, interventions that you've recorded, any new problems, contact numbers for the parents, for the receiving unit, drug charts, blood results, everything. And go through the checklist together. This is not, uh, this is just um, to symbolize the checklist. This is not an actual checklist. You have um, uh, two copies of checklists, I think, in, in, in the appendix from a uh, service in London and the service in Oxford that, that we use. And those checklists have grown as we have identified particular problems within our services. Um, but it's important that you go through that as a group. A checklist is not really a checklist with one person doing it independently, quietly on their own. It means um, equipment bag, check, yes. Patient labels, check, yes. So this is a group activity. Um, where you're confirming uh, the presence or absence of things. When you're talking to the family, introduce all the staff. I think it's really important in the setting that I come from, and I'm sure it, it would be much different here, is acknowledge the contribution of the local team. Certainly um, in a service that I, I work in, there is a sense that the transfer team have rescued the baby from an unsafe place. And I think it's really important to make sure that the, the parents are left with the impression that the local staff have done a good job and ultimately this baby will be repatriated to them for ongoing care. So it's important to establish that relationship. Outline with the parents the reasons and expectations for the transfer, particularly if there's a, 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 ch a chance that the patient may not survive, obviously. Um, give them some information about the receiving unit, exchange contact details, and often facilitating the parental transfer. That might mean they come with you if it's medically safe for them to do so. Um, or it might be that the, um, an antenatal transfer of the mother, uh, sorry, a postnatal transfer of the mother may be uh, uh, required. And be absolutely honest. Try not to guess the outcome of the baby. Just describe the current situation and what you're dealing with in front of you. Leaving the unit, it's important to liaise with the receiving unit because the patient that they may have been originally referred may have changed dramatically. The condition may have worsened, may have improved, the diagnosis may have changed. Uh, so discuss that with the receiving unit. You're not just telling them we're leaving and we will be with you in two hours' time. You're telling them unexpected issues, major treatment, treatment changes, ventilator settings, infusions that are running, dosages that, that, that have been given. And it's not a full handover, but you are um, uh, uh, telling them what to be prepared for. And obviously, if the condition deteriorates dramatically en route, you may need to contact uh, them again and then hand over on arrival. So the, the transport phase is actually three phases, leaving the referring unit, moving in the vehicle between the units, and then arriving at the receiving uh, unit. And the, the philosophy is to aim for stability or improvement rather than just avoiding deterioration. Now, the risks of needing to intervene en route are dramatically reduced by good preparation and packaging of the patient. And continuously evaluating the timing of the actual transfer. What's the best window to move? Always check and utilize ambulance power and gas supplies. Always ensure that a trolley incubator equipment and patients are secure in the vehicle before departure. Carry nothing loose. Anything can turn into a missile if in rapid braking. It's important, it affects staff, it affects patients. And certainly, you know, although road traffic accidents are, are infrequent, the, uh, the impact of them can be significant. And we've had our 
bad experiences in the UK uh, when gas cylinders are not secure and bags are not secured properly. Staff must wear seat belts, and I think it's really important that that has happened, that people remain restrained themselves, and that the ambulance should stop if there is a need to unbuckle and move around uh, the vehicle. Um, speed is rarely good for the baby. Usually it's bad for the baby, and sometimes for the staff. Excessive road speed is rarely justified on clinical grounds. Um, it, it's getting away from the idea that we've got a sick patient and that equates to emergency driving, lights and sirens, driving on the wrong side of the road. It, 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 the, the patient physiology is, is likely to be made worse by that manner of driving and the smoother the ride, the, 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 the better. It doesn't mean that you can't make other road users aware of your presence with the use of lights and sirens, but the reason we uh, in our services um, have chosen to use paramedics who come to our service for a year from the ambulance service is so that they learn the style of driving. The, the difference is dramatic when we just use frontline uh, um, ambulance crew. Stop for any interventions, and worst case scenario, if the patient needs resuscitation, one need, might need to divert to the nearest hospital if life-threatening uh, uh, deterioration occurs. The aim should be to observe and monitor the baby with the same level um, as a baby on a neonatal intensive care unit. So ongoing observations and documentation every 15 minutes of vital signs is essential. We know that in motion, sometimes non-invasive blood pressure and pulse oximetry can be unreliable. So back that up with your clinical skills and be alert for any early signs of, of deterioration. The final stage of ACCEPT is once you've arrived at the receiving hospital and you've uh, um, to, to, to the right to the end of the transfer. So the assessment is identifying any previously unrecognized problems that are now new. Control is delegation of tasks between your own team and the receiving unit staff. Communication is your handover. Um, and uh, evaluation is less relevant at this stage. Preparation is preparation of the infant uh, to be moved onto the receiving unit from transport incubator to unit cot and all the infusions and pumps and ventilation and everything. And then the final transportation phases after that is over and that when you're leaving the receiving hospital. So it's very important to have your pre-departure checklist to make sure you've got all of your equipment. Final handover of the receiving unit. The patient remains with responsibility of the transfer team until the handover is complete, the patient is moved across and all the associated equipment um, supporting the patient is moved across and the receiving unit team's questions have all been um, answered. We're going to talk a lot about communication and handover and what's needed at different stages um, because the level of information that's needed when one takes a referral should be restricted to what is important to make this patient stable. A complete background history at this point is not necessary. You just need to establish what the patient needs prior to the transfer team's arrival. The face-to-face -face handover actually at the uh, bedside is where all of the background information will come forward. And again, when you hand over at the receiving unit. As a transfer team member, you may only be responsible for this patient for a few hours. But the receiving unit will look at you as if you've been caring for this baby right from the start. So you need to have uh, ownership of all of the relevant information. So handover refer occurs twice in any given transfer, referring hospital to transport team, and then transport team to the receiving unit. And the conditions for the handover need to be um, identified in terms of the right people, the body language, listening, um, confirmation and summarising of uh, the information um, and clarifying any, any uh, queries. It's important, um, obviously after the verbal handover you're going to be re reviewing the x-rays, the blood results, the charts, etc. so that it's as comprehensive as possible and that it's done in a courteous manner. 
Um, completion of the transport, um, you need to make sure that the records are complete, they're filed in the patient's notes, and that as a transport service, you have a copy um, uh, of those records. Responsibility is a slightly odd uh, beast in that when you, from the time a referral is made for transfer, there are many clinicians involved. The referring hospital who are looking after the baby, advice that's coming from the transport team or the receiving unit. So uh, there is shared responsibility. The point of handover is probably where that, that responsibility starts to change. But even after handover, the patient is still in that referring hospital and something bad may happen. So it's important to, uh, to make sure that everyone is aware of what their tasks are. Okay, I've gone on to <coughs> overrun my time. Any questions at this point? Approach, such as using the accept process. And remember, nothing lasts forever, not oxygen, air, or batteries, so be prepared. Any questions at all? All ready to do some work? So we're going to split ourselves into four. Three. 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 Yes, please. So there's going to be, do uh, you know your groups? Four. Four. Four groups. So we, we are going to use the same accept model on four stages. Um, I think one group stays here, this section. So is it A, B, C, D, how you've been marked? Colors. Colors. Colors, okay, okay. So the green group goes that side. Okay, that's where you learn how to package it in front. How to safely package the baby and put them in an advanced photo incubator. I want you to see how do you look at the syringes and so on and so forth. Is it okay? So the green group, please stand up and, and move in that direction. So one of those can stick on this side. Whoever is there, can, can you join them there? And have a shade. Yellow, I know, can make different shades, but orange is a a trick, trick question. So the so red is there. Uh, then we have left with yellow and orange. The so green is gone. Green is gone. So here we we leave the yellows. Oranges can go home. <laughs> Just a minute. I'll I'll find a place for the for the oranges. Better time. So you will go to stage one. You will go the when you reach the patient. So I'll do something. And if you sit here, sit here, you
This station is what we are going to do is as if you are one of the team members who have come to to a to a baby in a peripheral hospital, say, who's already been referred. So the referral actually takes place in station one. And this is and before I go through, have you looked at the manual and seen all the things that are there at the back? Has, have you all looked at the manual? Because there are a lot of things. Few of them are few of them are checklists. So the idea is that we've got that station where you've taken a phone call and it's about what information do you need, what information you know, do you know, what do you ask, etc. How the station because what we learn is your package everything, or whatever you have. Your learning is mainly experiential. This is more what you remember is what you do. Not what you do. Because if you do stuff, you know, that's why you can create a very good thing. How you want transport or anything, but actually, you won't be. So I can bet you, you won't be one of our common You'll probably see a few users. But that's why the chapters are very thin and the resource material is not good. At the back, we've got a message where you can use these. This is the information. So, what we are going to do, the point I was going to was right there, is that what we want to do is take those modify it for your own. So one of the big things we do to set up any training workshops and is, is make sure that we all remember this. Let's, let's start. What, what do we that is why um, try and structure the workshop what minimal lectures. See, I've taught a lot in India. Well. We do uh, workshops in the UK. I teach on advanced ventilation workshop in the And that's the recurring theme. So, new learn from experience. Uh, when I say learn from experience, uh, experience uh, use real life examples from your life. So, so, that's, so make it real. Because if it does not link with their own experience, the nurses and doctors will not remember So one of the things that we use as a training thing in our transport workshop that we do in feels she can say something if she's worried. Um, it's incredible how it's so easy for one person to not see what is going on, the small things, whereas another person will. And it might be that the doctor is the one that misses it, that picks something up and says, oh, we must sort this out, but it might be the nurse, and we need to be able to make sure that they do, um, have the confidence to speak up. Okay. Now this baby, nothing sticks to this baby. <laughs> So, everybody happy with that fixation? People have slightly different ways of doing it. How you do it is your choice, as long as it is secure. You can buy lots of gadgets. You can buy what's called a Neofit, which is similar to this, and it fits the baby's face, and there's a bit of tape that runs around. There's the Neo Bar, which sticks to the baby's face. It's like a little bar up here, and you just secure the empty tube to that bar. They're great, but they're expensive. Okay. Um, they're very good for skin because the, the design of the, the sticky part is, is meant for preterm babies, so it's very good for the skin. But actually, with the right stuff underneath and the right care, there's nothing wrong with this. And what you want is an ET tube that's secure. And with that security, it's making sure that it's in the right position. 
because in the securing, how many times do you go? I've put my tube into eight centimeters and I've secured it. It's now at ten. So again, it's making sure that you've got absolutely everything right. You can make lots of adjustments on the unit. Once you're in the back of the ambulance, you shouldn't be making any adjustments. Okay. You can't do it at speed. You can't do it while the driver's dr driving. You hit a bump and you're trying to adjust the tube and you're going to put it. You can't do x-rays. You can't see if, if what you've done is correct. Um, so get it done before you move. Okay. So we're going to have a nice secure uh, airway. What would you next be? What would you want to secure next to make sure that the next most important thing? This baby's got a nice camera. Breaths for themselves and maintain their saturations, or whether actually it's going to be disastrous. And by the time you get them, they're completely hypoxic. What you want is what is a nice, smooth transition. You don't want to be uh, suddenly realising that when you pick up the baby, you're connected to six things that you've got to disconnect. So again, this is where you work together as a team. Uh, Utilise, you know, and often we find that the nurses are very uh, possessive. I think is the word. They're the ones that move the baby because they're very good at making sure the lines are in and secure and whatnot, um, and not tangled. <laughs> so how many times do you move these when you've got lines all tangled and you don't know which is which? So next I'm going to prepare the bed. Now you can do it one or two ways. Sometimes people will put the nest and the sheet in the bed and leave it there and just move the baby. But one of the things I find very useful is wrapping the child up. Because A, it helps with temperature control. With B, it helps with control of the lines. So what I would usually do is use this sheet, because this is really in the incubator to warm, sorry. And I will wrap this little baby up. Nice and secure. Making sure I know where my lines are. So my saturation point is there. There's my peripheral line. Lost my, there's my um, UVC. So I know where those two are. And my ET tube is connected to the, to the ventilator. Stick that on there for a second. And that child is now ready to move over. He will feel more secure. It will be much easier to control everything. And this is where you, you use your staff. Are you happy to help me? Yeah? Alright. I'm going to pick up the baby. If you can control the wires so that I don't tug anything out. And then we'll get somebody just to disconnect our imaginary ventilator. This baby does not stick. Okay, so. Right. And we will move when we are both ready. Okay, so everything's free. That one's not. Those are not, and I know about those. My baby is nice and safe and secure. You can pull that wire as well. That he does it. Okay, so we're going to disconnect, pick up, and nice and gently move across. I'm not going to get tangled. And in the baby goes. And then connect the ventilator. Okay. Right. So next, we've just got to get this child secure in. We've got to make sure that everything has stayed secure for the baby to um, be safer than do. But I wouldn't leave this like this because that is tugging on the tube and it's just going to pull it all out. So put it in a position where it's good. Right. Now I'm going to collect my ECG. <coughs> Thank you.